Jeff, it's a great day for a hike here in the woods of Arcadia, Rhode Island, just off of Ten Rod Road. It is, Ray. Spring has finally sprung. Yeah, it's nice to be back outside. Mm. Looking for legends here on Mount Tom. Mount Tom is only 430 feet above sea level <laughs> at its highest point. Right. So calling it a mount is, you know, being a little overly kind. Yeah, you might be right. And Rhode Island isn't known for its mountains, let's be honest. Right. But it does have plenty of ghosts. All right, so what are we looking for? We're searching for the ruins of an old house from long ago. It may be barely a cellar hole now. Okay, well, how are we going to know if we find it? Uh, uh, uh. I think we just did. Hi, I'm Jeff Belanger, and welcome to episode 90 of the New England Legends podcast. If you give us about 10 minutes, we'll give you something strange to talk about today. And I'm Ray Osier. Thanks for joining us on our mission to chronicle every New England legend one week and one story at a time. Our episode this week is brought to you by our Patreon patrons. Thank you, patrons. If you go to patreon.com slash New England Legends for as little, as little as $3 per month, Per month. Even I could afford that. It's a cup of coffee. Come on. You get early access to new episodes plus bonus episodes that no one else gets to hear. Thank you to everyone helping with our production and hosting costs. Did you know you can also call or text us anytime on our legend line at 617-444-9683? I did know that. I know you knew that. But sometimes our story ideas come from you guys, like it did this week. This is Tom Marcella. And I am from Warwick, Rhode Island. A story I haven't seen yet. It's the Moaning Bones of Mount Tom. I'm sure you've heard it before. And I haven't seen it on any of the podcasts. You're right, Tom. We haven't covered this one yet. So let's get on it. All right, Jeff. If we find this cellar hole, are we going to find those Moaning Bones? Mm, We might. This story was first written down in the 1937 book commissioned by the U.S. Government Works Progress Administration, which is called the WPA Guide to Rhode Island. So you could say these are your federal tax dollars at work. (laughs) But there's a second strange story from the same exact region that we're also going to have to explore. All right, to get to the bottom of this, we'll have to go further back than 1937. Right. We'll have to go back to the early 1800s, back when this village of Arcadia within the larger town of Exeter, Rhode Island, was still new. We're standing in a lonely little farmhouse here on the slope of Mount Tom. Inside, the only two occupants are the farmer and his teenage daughter. But there's about to be a knock at the door. Outside the farmhouse, a peddler comes calling. The farmer doesn't seem all that interested in buying anything, so the peddler offers a trade. He's willing to sharpen all the knives in the farmer's house in exchange for a meal and a night's lodging. And the farmer agrees. That night, the peddler eats his supper with the farmer and his daughter. The company is pleasant enough. The food is good. Once dinner is finished and the daughter clears the table, the peddler gets to work on the farmer's knives. When the daughter finishes cleaning up after dinner, she bids her father and their guests good night and then retires to her bedroom upstairs. But just when she's falling asleep, she hears some commotion downstairs. The daughter leaps out of bed rushes down the stairs, and finds the peddler lying in a pool of his own blood. On the kitchen table, a bag of silver is spilled out. The daughter immediately realizes what's happening, so she grabs for the peddler's bag and looks for trinkets and other items that she can keep for herself. As his daughter is going through the peddler's stuff, the farmer gets to work moving the hearthstones out of the way and digging a hole for the peddler's body. With the last hearthstone back in place, the farmer looks at his daughter with a suspicious eye as she places a ring from the peddler's bag on her finger. The farmer, he doesn't think his daughter will be able to keep her mouth shut about this heinous murder. So he takes matters into his own hands. He picks up one of the newly sharpened kitchen knives. He squeezes his daughter's cheeks so hard it forces her tongue to stick out. And then he cuts off his daughter's tongue ensuring she'll keep her silence. This is really disturbing. No remorse, just murder for the sake of a bag of silver. And then to disfigure his own daughter. What a horrible monster. Being disfigured and unable to talk, no one ever marries the young girl. So she's stuck taking care of her father in this house until his death. She then lives out the rest of her days here all alone. It would seem they got away with murder. Or did they? Something happens when a home is abandoned. Yeah. Nature takes over pretty quickly. 
grasses and vines grow into the stones and foundation, leaks form, right. water seeps in, and within a few years, nature takes back what's rightfully hers. All around the ruins of the farmhouse, blackberry bushes grow and surround what's left of the structure, which, after a few decades, is nothing more than the stone chimney and hearth. It's an empty shell of what it once was. The sweet ripe blackberries draw in some of the kids from Arcadia who are out hunting for treats. But as the kids are picking berries, they hear something. It's faint at first, but then it grows louder. The children are petrified and run back home to fetch their parents. When the parents see the genuine fear in their kids' eyes, they waste no time gathering up some picks and shovels to confront whatever boogeyman is out there scaring the kids. But when they arrive, they too hear the moans. Not seeing anyone, they follow the sounds to the old hearth. And there, they start digging. As the old stones are removed, they find the skeleton of the peddler who was murdered and hidden away. The people from the village gather up the bones and offer him a proper burial. While justice is never served, at least there's some closure for this forever unnamed peddler. There seems to be a lot of vague details here, Jeff. Yeah, I know. No names, no dates, just the story. I get that, but sometimes it's all we have to go on. Okay, well, I guess that brings us back to present day. Whoa, 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 Ray. Bef okay. Before we head back, there's another murder to investigate right here on Mount Tom and right off of Ten Rod Road. Another murder? With this story, we do have more names and dates, thanks to an article written by J. Earl Clausen and published November 15th, 1935, in the Evening Bulletin newspaper out of Providence. So according to Clausen, this event occurred around the 1830s in a little gray farmhouse that sits on top of Molasses Hill just off of Ten Rod Road, which is the slope of Mount Tom. The house is where Samuel Barber lives, who the neighbors call Side Hill Sammy. Who Side Hill Sammy bought the house from has been lost to the fog of time. So one day, Side Hill Sammy is near the bottom of the hill digging loads of muck that he spreads in his cow yard and pig pen, which turns into fertilizer with the help of his animals. Right. While digging in the muck, Sammy suddenly unearths a human skeleton. He digs a little more and also finds an old horse saddle practically rotted away to nothing. Wow. Sammy is the kind of guy who can keep a secret, so he gathers the bones and the remains of the saddle and brings them back to his barn where he cleans them off. He sets the saddle in the corner of the barn and places the bones in the attic to dry out. So Sidehill Sammy is the kind of man who doesn't like dealing with authority figures more than he has to. I mean, dealing with them at tax time is quite enough, <laughs> thank you very much. True. But Sammy is curious about this find, so he starts discreetly asking some of his neighbors and family if they've ever heard about a person going missing around here. Sammy finds enough pieces of the story that he believes he lands on the truth. Years ago, this area was even more rural than it is now. And it's still pretty rural. Right. Traveling peddlers were how many people got life's shiny little extras. Right. Different peddlers worked different regions and often became familiar fixtures in the community. One neighbor told Sammy he heard about a peddler who rode up to the gray farmhouse on the hill and wasn't seen again. Now, this was years before Side Hill Sammy ever owned the property. The neighbor said he once walked into the house to find the farmer's wife weeping in her rocking chair. On the floor, he saw spots of blood. He knows no farmer slaughters a chicken inside the house, but still, he asked. The owner of the house shrugs, and nothing more was ever spoken of it. Sidehill Sammy passes away and leaves the house to his son, Edward Barber. The year is now 1860, and Edward's daughter, Joni, along with a neighbor girl named Blivin, are up in the attic when they discover a collection of human bones. But the girls don't seem frightened at all. Ooh, let's have a funeral, Joni says. We can dig a grave and have flowers and everything. Come on. The girls take the bones outside. They dig a hole near their orchard. They place the old bones in the hole, cover it with dirt and flowers, then do their best to say words they recall hearing at other funerals. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, we commit your body to the ground. And that would be the end of the Molasses Hill Peddler. And that brings us back to today. All right, so we have not only one, but two stories of murdered peddlers yeah. in the region of Mount Tom in Rhode Island. This is a really small area, by the way. <laughs> it is, for two murders, I know. And I guess if you're a door-to-door -door peddler, stay far, far away from the area of Arcadia and <laughs> Exeter, Rhode Island. 
All right. Well, do you think these stories could be true? The idea of those door-to-door peddlers is pretty foreign to us today, but back then there were no malls, no online shopping, and and stores were few and far between. You have to remember that general stores carried everyday items that you all needed, but the specialty things like fancy buttons and trinkets and jewelry and stuff like that, you would get that from a peddler. Well, there's also the social aspect to this. Okay. Many wives of farmers had almost no social interaction. These traveling peddlers not only provided fancy items, but outside news, gossip, and conversations that couldn't be found anywhere else. Sure. And that could, of course, lead to some jealousy with the farmer, I would imagine. Right. A jealous husband driven to murder. A tale as old as time. (laughs) That's so true. Well, I think there's some truth here because both stories were written down in the 1930s. Both have kicked around a very small town for close to a century before that. So my guess is that the truth is somewhere in there. I don't necessarily think two peddlers were murdered for their wares, but I know that murdering a peddler is something that happened. They had money and goods, and maybe some got a little too flirty with the wives. I like the idea that the moaning bones still cry out for justice. Yeah. The fog of time may have forgotten their names, but this story forces us to remember they were people. Every legend sticks around for something, even if we don't fully understand why at the time. All right, if you'd like to check out our entire archive of shows, plus leave us comments, see clips from the New England Legends series on Amazon Prime, or check out upcoming dates for Jeff's story tour, visit OurNewEnglandLegends.com. We'd like to thank my daughter, Sophie Belanger, for lending her voice acting (laughs) talents this week. Great job. And, of course, our music is by John Judd. Until next time, remember, the bizarre is closer than you think. (laughs) 